Yeah, lots of people think that you know we we just keep on supplying uh, our neighbors and we're providing them with energy and doing them, but we also import from them. And one of them is Kabora Bassa. It's coming up now, and I think some of the questions were around this. The, is significant, as you know, fighting. Safety, quality, focus becomes the uh, ESCO view of ESCO suppliers. Uh, dilemmas, uh, greater RDM incentives needed to compensate lower tariffs, which Derek brought up to one of the questions. Our tariffs are low. We're about third or fourth in the world at the moment. So there are other companies can make this, these things viable because the tariffs are high. Uh, even gas is becoming just on a par with electricity, the cost of gas. So even if you go to natural gas and there are pipelines from from Cecil all the way down into our southern hub that the guys are using uh, natural gas, but it comes at a price, it's not cheap. Um, funding significant reduced, so targets uh, remain largely unchanged. So they want to give us more money, I mean less money, but they want to increase the targets. And then PV renewable, as I mentioned on the SOP, that was, um, that was good, it gave us uh, good uh, savings, but like I said, the performance is down. Uh, electricity demand is also dropping. Our revenue is a big problem in Eskom as well. Not just generation, revenue is dropping. People are using less and going to alternative energy, and so they're using less energy. So our revenue goes down. But that, we've also got a problem where people aren't paying their energy, not paying for electricity. And that's not just for customers, by the way. It's not just, everybody thinks it's just the lower level guys that aren't paying. There's commercial and industrial guys that owe us 50, 60,000 rand a month that they're not paying. Those are bypassing meters. We've got a team of guys going around just, there's, a, there's this phase in, in South Africa where you don't need to pay for energy. And guys are bypassing meters and that's not only ourselves, the municipalities have the same problem. So we've got teams of guys looking into that at the moment. So it's not just, you know, one part of the population not paying. It's a lot of people aren't at the moment paying. This just give you an idea of, from our plans, what sort of technologies we're looking at at the moment and new initiatives. But solar water heating, shower heads, heat pumps, compressors, process optimization, we haven't really gone deep into those savings. We can still make huge savings on it. There's still huge opportunities. We go into plants every day and we see it. So there's, there, we haven't uh, saturated that market with those technologies at this stage. So we, 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 we're still looking to push these things. And like I said, HVAC is one of those. And then we're also looking at new technology like VSDs for the agricultural market. And LEDs. That's it. Uh, it was a bit long and uh, laborious. Uh, sorry if I bored you. I hope I've been able to give you a lot of information about what IDM and maybe what ESCOM is doing at the moment. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to talk to you. If you have any questions, uh, give me a shout. Any questions? Just one right at the back. We've got one last presentation to go um, from Mr. Barry Bradenkamp. He's from South African National Energy Development Institute. Uh, talk to us about uh, financing mechanisms for energy efficiency. He is the senior manager at Sunny, where he is the gentleman that is going to you know, give us tips on how to approach the person. Um, without further ado, and then after that, um, Cool Ideas is going to come up uh, in the call to help facilitate you taking your questions and, um, and help us answer those questions that you might have. And then Mr. Chisabula is going to close off the session for us before we go for lunch. So that will be all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure. Thanks for being invited to come and speak to you about probably the most boring topic, which is taxation. Uh, just on a lighter note, Colin was explaining the process of Crushing the coal at the power station. Introduction, uh, as was said, the South African National Energy Development Institute is a state-owned entity reporting to the Department of Energy. It's uh, a, a juristic entity established by the Energy Act in 2008 with two primary functions. The one is research and development in the energy space and all energy carriers excluding nuclear, and NEXA does that. 
and then the implementation of energy efficiency to improve the performance of the economy in the country. Things that are certainly like we've heard this over and over is taxation and debt. We know that those are the two sorts of things. But we've just added another one to the list and that is that the 12 other 12 I tax incentives are year and especially 12 I you have to stay until at least 2020. So in terms of planning, it's a lot easier than the current estimate here program that you don't know when it's on, when it's off, when they've got money, when they haven't got money. You know, the tax incentive will be here until the 1st of January 2020. It cannot change negatively, it can improve positively, uh, but it will be there up until the 1st of January 2020. Trial Isles specifically, Trial has been around for a while and you've seen some of the following uh, slides. Trial Isles specifically was promulgated in December but backdated to the 1st of November 2013. Now that's a critical date. That is when the regulation came into effect and from the 1st of November 2013 up until the 1st of January 2020, projects with energy savings qualify for the tax incentives in terms of this regulation. Projects that were implemented prior to the 1st of November 2013 uh, do not qualify. And, and, and that's important because a lot of people are now going back to look at the savings that were achieved prior to that date and trying to submit those projects. And unfortunately, that is water under the bridge and you probably have paid off those technologies with the current rising rate of electricity and the tax incentive wouldn't apply to those particular technologies or projects. Just a bit of history, taxation, we all associate taxation with something that we don't like and something we have to get, that we have to pay, it's taxation that we are, are burdened with every month. We get our pay slips, we see how much goes for tax, and at the end of the year we still have to do a tax return. The SARS, there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and that pot of gold is sitting in a SARS office somewhere in Germany or in Pretoria. So please do apply for the tax incentives, there is money to be made there. And with that, I will. Uh, Leave my questions to Freddy, who is the new garden block, and he said he wants to answer all the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think we're going to go into question and answer session. Um, but just quickly, I want to, from uh, cool ideas, thank uh, the guest speakers. Some of them have taken time out of their busy schedules. Uh, Barry, thank you very much for coming down and project. Colin from Eskim, taking time out of your busy schedule this morning. Sorry about that, you were swamped this morning, and uh, thanks for coming through. Derek Tabili and Jason from the PSC and Energy Office, and we want to thank the PSC and Energy Office for sponsoring this event. And I just want to, Greg will take over now on the on technical details, but uh, just to encourage you all to engage, and we thank you for responding. Uh, so positively to this event, we weren't expecting too many people, but uh, 30 went to 100, and then we started cutting off uh, respondees. So it was great to see it, and I just want to encourage you, we're all in this together, so engage. We've got uh, contact details for PSE, Energy Office, uh, Barry. Put your questions forward, engage. I know a lot of people are at a tipping point and don't really know what to do. But don't get stuck there. Engage with the PSC, engage with your energy office. We've got to save this energy. It's, it's good for the planet, it's good for South Africa. And I encourage you to move forward. Uh, don't just stop here. You're right at the start. 50% of your work is now done. It's just a, about finding out more and carrying it through. Greg, will you come through and then we can take questions and answers? We've got. Uh, Power problems, base load and peak load problems. Um, is the question of time saving, that daylight saving, is that still on the cards? Um, I was listening to David Shapiro the other day and he, he was actually quite good on the TV and the tongue in cheek and he said, Eskim, it's fine, we can have load shedding, just be organized. Just tell us when and then we can just shut Cape Town down for a month and they won't even notice and then we can carry on as normal. But, uh, so the question I ask is, you know, is there uh, feasibility in moving Durban an hour ahead of Cape Town an hour behind to flatten that load or is they just a fine the sky and dream? Craig can answer that. Yep, there you go. Yeah, we've done research on, um, on daylight savings and it's not like Durban. 
And the problem is that in our latitude, we have a very narrow margin of sunlight variation. So it doesn't move a lot. Like in the northern hemisphere, at high latitudes, the sun goes until, until 10 in the evening, for example. So they've got a much bigger margin to play with. You essentially an hour either way. And what it does is just shifts people to commute in the dark. And energy savings from doing that are, are, are not really worth the effort. So the, the report's on our website if you want to look at the details. But the recommendation was that for some sectors it makes sense, but it does make sense for municipality to implement compulsory um, daylight savings. But if you want to, at a voluntary level, depending on the way your business operates, you can do it. That's right. And on a national scale, I, I do believe, historically, that just after the war, South Africa did have a, a daylight savings there, I'm talking nationally, uh, but for a short period of time. There's been studies over a period of time in the 80s. There was a study done, a national study, and just recently, after the 2008 um, load shedding we had, uh, it was driven by Kalula and a couple of the airlines, because the airlines seemed to benefit the most. But what came out of that was that you know, the economic benefits in relation to the actual change in uh, why we do things amongst the business, the banking sector, commuters that commute between Cape Town and and um, Durban and Jasper, all the major centres, but you know, the economic benefits were far less than the actual you know, change in everything we had to do. So, but I do believe, I mean, we've seen successful countries, New Zealand's a southern hemisphere country that did very successfully. The time might be right to relook at that, you know, on a national scale. I, I agree. I think it would be more the center of, of, of the country and Cape Town, because Cape Town does have that late sunset. So Durban, I'm not sure if it was a benefit, but one would have to look at it. Thanks. Uh, my question is for Colin. Um, before, there was a question from the floor about uh, the budget speech, and you mentioned a figure of about 250 billion, correct? Now, when you say you need 250 billion, is it for delivering secure domestic power supply without having to import power from outside, or does that figure include financing what I term ESCOM's Unicorn project, which would be something like the Great Inga project in the Congo that you guys have proposed? Okay, it's got nothing to do with, got nothing to do with, with any of the external projects. It's just for us to be able to deliver on the demand we have at the moment. So we, we just don't have enough supply to, to match that demand at the moment. So that's the money for both programs that we need to, to keep that going so we can meet demand. Okay, thanks. Also a question for Colin. Um, is there, because I still battle with the contradiction that ESCOM presents, that on the one side you're looking to finance generation, and on the other side you're looking to finance non-consumption of electricity. Um, what is the thinking now, if you, if you are able to share with us, the thinking within ESCOM? Do, do you envisage continuing in that role going well into the future, or is there some sort of like realignment of those, uh, those contradictions taking place within, within ESCOM? Right, the supply and demand, and you have to try to match. I mean, if nobody else is doing energy efficiency, we found it would be helpful for us to sponsor those initiatives and reduce the energy. So it's revenue lost to us but it's also helping us to manage supply and demand. So at some point when the supply can match the demand, we don't need to do a DSM anymore and have that contradiction. But at some point, somebody's got to do something about it and we felt as the supplier of energy, we needed to do it because nobody else is going to do it. So at some point when we've got all this generation supply available and the demand is reduced, then we won't have to do IDM. But you know, I think for a long time still in the future, we're going to have to do energy efficiency. Because the opportunities are huge still out there. We, we are pointed out earlier, we are wasting energy. Mm -hmm. And it's not as cheap as what it used to be. How many people out of the current uh, group have a are actually participating in the PSSC program? Just put your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And uh, maybe what we can do is to say, what is your experience? Is it, how did you find it? Well, we only signed up yesterday. So. <laughs> okay, so how long did that take? The two weeks, the three weeks, or six months? <laughs> two days. Two days. Okay. So the proof is in the pudding. Yes. And it's been they did an assessment, took about four days to scope the property. And then 
we had a consultant on site that monitored our power consumption and then for two, three weeks. After that, they called us, made a close up meeting, and they presented the, the audit file. And it was, it was incredible to see what was actually going on. Um, it was on the basis of that report, you can basically implement all the measures you want. And then they also tell you uh, which ones are best implemented, like the low cost, medium cost, high cost. And now you recuperate your money back. Thank you. Alright, so it's a uh, non-fantasy story. Intention of improving existing facilities. Do you also have guidelines for proposed development and uh, improving designs of something that hasn't been operating yet? Uh, I'll, I'll let Chisa uh, Kudo answer that, but I don't think so. No, no, we're not looking at new build. We're looking at uh, in, in, in existing, or, uh, and then you can retrofit them. Effectively, you want to reduce the existing test uh, and consumption. On the track of previous audits, uh, we've had a company recently uh, whose facility we audited, uh, which is a very new facility. It's in operation for five years now in, in, in KZN, and they're planning a 100% expansion project. And so, part of our audit, we did we assisted them with design concepts for for the new expansion as well. Yeah. So we wouldn't do it for greenfield projects off field, brownfields doing expansions, uh, we would advise on that. Mm. There, there's rules anyway, forest 50,001, and the, the local regulations. When you put plans forward, you have to show that you've done energy efficiency. So with your plans, so that's why we won't tackle things like that anyway, because the new boat should be looking at new technology uh, from the beginning anyway existing facility and you want to add to it that can be considered yes but if you don't have a facility and it's a new facility you see we, we, doesn't we, we, exist. we audit the existing facility and from there the safety opportunities from there we will incorporate and advise the new expansion does that clarify okay, any more questions basically we spent for the last year the british government has given an incentive for them this year if you don't use the money it goes back to the UK. I do, my presentation, the first slide, shows it was the Brits that were the, the guys that were responsible for introducing the tax. So it's their taxpayers' money now. So let's bloody well use it because they caused the problem in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing I've just been thinking about is daylight savings. Terry, uh, um, I reckon if you develop surfboards with LED headlights, then daylight savings might work. I don't think it's a commuter to worry about it. I actually need to offer at 4 o'clock to go surfing. So that's innovation for you, sir.